as well as influenza. So I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk today about update, an update on our phase one clinical trial of DSCAV1, otherwise known as a stabilized RSV prefusion F-glycoprotein vaccine. Thanks to the first talk in this, oh, I have no disclosures other than being a federal employee in the US. Um, thanks to the first speaker, I can skip a couple of my intro slides, which also means that I might have a chance to breathe in between talking. <laughs> Um, so this is the VRC, and I'll just point out uh, that we do basic science research in this building uh, on the, the main Bethesda campus at the NIH to develop new vaccines. We also do immunology and virology there, led by Dr. John Muscola. Um, and we also have a clinical trials program across the street in uh, the clinical center at the NIH where we do phase one clinical trials of some of our products. Those products are produced, uh, and sorry, the clinical trials program is run by Julie Ledgerwood. Um, the products are produced in a facility that's up north uh, in Frederick and Gaithersburg that's run by Frank Arnold, who does GMP production and product development of some of our products. So all of these folks that are pictured here who are the PIs and the program directors at the VRC were involved in um, the work that I'll be talking about today. And my outline is uh, to review some biology of RSV and F protein, but less than I thought. Uh, development of the DSCAV1 vaccine, and then show some interim results of our VRC317 clinical trial of DSCAV1 in healthy adults. Uh, this is one of the slides I'm going to skip. Um, challenges for RSV vaccine development, you've already heard a bit about this, but they include severe disease occurring at the extremes of age, which are um, age groups that are more difficult to vaccinate. Um, in addition, despite minimal variation in antigenicity, the virus suppresses and evades the human immune response. Um, and also, there is a history uh, of vaccine-enhanced disease, which the field has been dealing with for over 50 years. So 2017 was the anniversary of uh, vaccine-enhanced disease from a, a clinical trial that occurred immunizing infants in 1965 and 66 winter season, who then subsequently uh, had infections in 1966-67 season. And the key features here that I'll point out are in the RSV, uh, formalin and activated RSV vaccinated group, 80% um, of those babies were hospitalized and two of them died, uh, as opposed to a control group that was formalin and activated PIV in which 5% uh, were hospitalized and there were no deaths. Um, this has uh, led to 50 years of work on figuring out exactly why this happened and trying to avoid it in all future attempts to vaccinate and protect babies. Some of the work um, that has uh, told us something about what happened is uh, shown here. And it basically compares a response to natural infection with response to vaccination with FIRSV, showing that in natural infection, not only do you get um, high levels of IgG uh, binding to the F protein measured by ELISA, but you also get high functional levels of antibody, here measured by a fusion inhibition assay, but also could be measured by a neutralization assay. Whereas in the vaccinated cohort, you did see high levels of IgG uh, binding to the F protein measured by ELISA, but you did not see the functional antibody, which suggests that um, you had a high level of non-functional antibody, which may have been responsible for some of the um, enhanced disease. Now, what have we done since that time? Well, this is just a quick snapshot from PATH, which was updated in October of this year, showing um, all of the various methods by which people have introduced um, pipeline uh, candidates, live attenuated uh, particle-based vaccines, one of which is in a phase three trial, and there should be some data on that forthcoming in the next few months, several subunit vaccines, nucleic acid delivery methods, recombinant vectors, and then I'll point out here at the bottom the one licensed product is Synergis or Palavizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody that's given to preterm infants uh, to um, prophylax against RSV and severe outcomes. Um, and I will just say that most of the work is not focused on the whole inactivated uh, methodology that was used for that initial FIRSV vaccine. I'm going to focus on our subunit vaccine uh, for F. So how did we get to where we are now? Uh, one of the key steps was identifying and, um, and mapping the atomic level structure of the F protein, both in its post-fusion and its pre-fusion form. Uh, the prefusion. this is the publication from 2013 from our group at the VRC, Jason McClellan, Barney Graham, Peter Kwong, and others, um, were able to identify 
uh, the, the detailed structure of what was able to be seen on the surface of the viral envelope by cryo-EM or by cryo-electron microscopy, uh, you could see this sort of round globular squat version of F and this elongated version. Turns out that this is the post-fusion F and this is the pre-fusion F, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Um, what the pre-F has taught us is that there are certain epitopes that are conserved on both of these forms. Uh, and those tend to be uh, the ones pictured here in yellow and pink. Uh, site 2 is actually the binding site for palivizumab or Synergis, which is the current prophylactic antibiotic. Um, and that is a neutralizing epitope. But the new sites that were discovered at the tip of the pre-F protein uh, conformation are actually even more potently neutralizing or induce more potently neutralizing antibody responses than those found uh, on uh, shared surfaces, and there's about a 50% shared surface between the pre and the post F. This is just a bit of data um, showing when you sort using a probe in flow cytometry made from the stabilized pre F or the post F, you can pull out human memory B cells from adults who've been multiply infected with RSV, and you see that those that are specific only for the pre F probe tend to have the most potent neutralizing activity when you make monoclonals from them. Those that are specific for both or that hit dual, the dual surfaces tend to be intermediate and those that are specific for the post F tend to be the least neutralizing. So understanding the structure of pre F also helped to explain something else. Um, it was known from work by Jose Molero's group uh, that the post F, if it was pre-incubated with human sera, did not remove all of the neutralizing activity. In fact, it didn't remove very much neutralizing activity from human sera. Whereas now that we had the pre-F molecule, if we do the same experiment, you can see that the pre-F actually does remove most of that neutralizing antibody. So the structure did help us explain that finding. Um, and when things make sense for one virus, in some cases they can help us with others. So this is just the group of class one fusion proteins uh, on other viruses like coronavirus, influenza, HIV envelope, Ebola, GP, many of the others you've heard about since we've been here. Um, and they are all very similar in some ways to RSVF in that they have class one um, fusion protein properties, an endoproteolytic cleavage site, uh, which when cleaved releases a fusion peptide that can then insert itself into the host cell membrane. This is just a cartoon of how that happens, but this is how F protein mediates fusion and viral entry. So you have a globular head that either by binding receptor or spontaneously uh, can rearrange itself and the, the fusion peptide inserts into the host cell membrane. The two ends of the molecule then come together um, based on two heptad repeats into a very stable structure which is now what we know to be the post F structure. Um, and then that brings the two membranes together and delivers the nucleocapsid and the genome into the target cell. What's known about this is that this does not reverse. So once this is flipped from the pre F to the post F, it does not go back. Uh, this is too stable and this is metastable. And then that can help us understand another finding which has been known for a while, which is that heat inactivates live uh, virus. So if you have RSV and you heat it up to 37 degrees and leave it there for several days, you see the infectivity of the virus drop off. So it makes sense that as the infectivity um, drops off, that that would be related to the fact that it no longer has pre-fusion F on its surface. So if the virus is coated with all post-fusion that can't fuse, uh, it would clearly not be so infectious. What we were then able to do with the pre-F probe and, the, and also with pre-F specific monoclonal antibodies, as well as uh, a, a palivizumab-like um, antibody that binds both to pre and post F, we were able to assess the status of what F is on formalin and activated RSV. So we treated, uh, our, we treated live virus with formalin at 37 degrees for 96 hours. We can see that the, the F protein is not leaving the virus. It's still there. You can detect it uh, with motivizumab, which binds to both forms. But all three of the monoclonals that bind only to the pre-F show a decrease in binding, suggesting that you are, in fact, having flipping of the molecule over to the non-infective post-F state. So we would suggest that FIRSV vaccine that caused enhanced disease was primarily a post-F vaccine. Now, this is a table that just summarizes some of the other RSV F protein uh, subunit vaccines that have gone through uh, the pipeline and clinical trials. And I would suggest, and our group would suggest, that most of these were probably not pre-fusion F um, in, the, in the way that we're describing pre-fusion F. 
they had certain features in their immune responses, including newt titers that were in the range of a boost of two to maybe five fold, and ELISA F titers that were a rise of much higher than that, so three to 30 fold. So if you do a ratio where you take the ELISA titer and uh, fold rise and divide it by the newt titer fold rise, you get numbers greater than one, in some cases all the way up to 10. So remember that, I'll bring it up again later when we're talking about our vaccine response. Okay, so finally enough background. We made a prefusion F uh, stabilized vaccine based on structural knowledge and the epitope map. Uh, we added a disulfide bond and a cavity filling mutation, mutation and thus called it DS, CAV1. Uh, and we also put on a trimerization domain and made it GMP in CHO cells to start a VRC317 clinical trial. Uh, this is a dose escalation phase one clinical study where we gave 50, 150, or 500 micrograms without or with alum adjuvant at day zero and week 12. Uh, and we had a total of 90 volunteers. Uh, first enrollment was February 21st, 2017. Uh, there's Barney Graham. Um, and we have now um, basically completed enrollment, but today what I'm going to show you is data from the interim analysis um, that we prospectively set out to do, which is on the first 10 subjects in the first four groups. So that's the 50 and 150, uh, 100 microgram doses with and without alum. Um, the vaccine has so far been safe and well tolerated in all the subjects that have received it. We're only talking about uh, post prime or post first dose today. So you can see here, um, cut to the chase, that the DSCAV1 vaccine elicits potent neutralizing activity against subtypes A and B. Um, this is um, log two, which is a convention in the RSV field to show everything in log two. And though that's confusing, you can still see that all of these subjects had a, a significant rise, regardless of whether they were uh, in the, one, the 150 or the 50 microgram dose group and whether they got alum or not. Um, and then we're here using a reporter virus system to measure these pseudonutes. Just to give you the numbers, you can see the fold change here um, in the 50 microgram dose group didn't change based on whether or not they had alum. Um, we do see a statistically significant increase with the higher dose at 150 micrograms, but no statistically significant difference between alum and no alum here. There's another way we can look at this, which is to look at confirmation-specific neutralization. Um, the first graph here is just the data you just saw, which is uncompeted or standard neutralization reported in log two for RSVA. And then the next uh, set of data is when we put in post-F and compete out some of the neutralization activity, you can see there is a small drop in both the pre- and the post-vaccine time points, but it certainly doesn't abrogate this rise, this boost of, of neutralization activity. However, when you compete with the pre-F, you drop the neutralization activity across both time points and you no longer see any boost, which makes sense because we're giving a pre-F only vaccine. Um, and the same is true in the 150 microgram dose we can also look at this uh, by flow cytometry using those, B, those probes um, based on DSCAV1 or PREF and also a post-F probe. So if you sort uh, B cells, these are IgG, uh, you can see there are populations that tend to prefer to bind to the PREF, those that bind to both uh, the pre and the post-F, and only a few uh, hits down there that bind to the, the post-F only. That's just one example. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, looking at ELISA to post-F, um, so this is IgG, you can also see that there is a significant rise. Now, this uh, adds the alum and no alum groups together as there was no significant difference here, but a significant rise in the ELISA titers. But when you do the little calculation that I was describing earlier, where you make a ratio of the nude activity or the ELISA to the nude activity, you see that though the historical range was up greater than one and up as high as 10 for that ratio, our ratio in both of those dose groups was less than one, about 0.7 or 0.75. And so that would suggest that our antibody that we're inducing is um, primarily neutralizing antibody or, or functional antibody. And then I'll just give you one more bit of detail about that antibody. You can look at uh, where it binds by using uh, competition. So here we're looking at um, site zero competed, which are the two, uh, which are the sites on top of the pre-F molecule that are so neutralization sensitive. Uh, and you can see that there is a rise in both groups to um, the site zero competed pre-F binding IgG. There is also a rise to site two, 
uh, which makes sense because site two is on our vaccine. Um, and so we're, we are making uh, antibody responses to both the apex and the side of PREA. Oh, and there's my graphic of one binding to the side of PREA. Uh, and then a little bit more on the flow cytometry. This just shows you the week zero time point, looking at IgG positive cells, binding to the pre-F probe, binding to the post-F probe, binding to both. And of course, you see the enhancement in the numbers of cells that are binding to pre-F and to the dual specific. Um, you can also see IgA uh, as well. And these are just quantitation of uh, both of those. And then just to, to back up the IgA data in the B cells, here is uh, pre-F binding IgA, and it turns out there is a significant rise that you can detect in the serum in both of these dose groups of IgA to this vaccine. I went backwards instead of forwards. And this just shows you a bit of, um, of a time course, so week zero, week two, week 12, and week 14. We will be doing much more detailed analysis on longer time course as well of this data, but this is just dividing it up again, as you're seeing in the flow cytometry here, the pre-F preferring, the dual binders, and they're still there at 12 and 14 weeks. They have not gone down to baseline. In fact, we might have reset the baseline, which is what we hope. And then one last uh, data slide. Uh, these are just a couple of interesting correlations that we found in our data. So week zero <laughs> predictors of what the week four neutralizing activity ended up being. Uh, and you can see the correlations and the p-values up above. Um, one of them is, of course, your baseline RSV A newt that at week zero predicts and correlates with your, your week four newt. But uh, interestingly, the IgA binding to pre-F at week zero also tightly correlated with your final newt titer at four weeks, which was surprising. Okay, so that's all my data. Um, our conclusions are that this clinical trial is basically a, a um, is a proof of concept for structure-based vaccine design because it shows that a structure-guided solution for RSV vaccine development is possible, uh, and it's based on this confirmation-dependent immunogenicity of the pre-F pro or the pre-F vaccine. Um, and to summarize the clinical data, uh, the pre-F vaccine candidate induced greater than tenfold rise in newt activity, which would correlate uh, or which would um, convert to maybe three, three to four months of extra protection in a neonate if that vaccine were given to a pregnant mom. Um, minimal effects of alum, but a small effect of dose. Um, the ELISA to newt ratio is less than one, indicating that the antibodies that were induced are neutralizing. The antibody response binds to pre-F or is pre-F specific. Um, and IgG and A are both boosted. And pre-existing serum levels of IgA against pre-F anticipate that uh, final newt response. We're continuing to look at T cell and B cell analysis over the time course of the whole study. Of course, we'll be looking at the full cohort and um, after the boost as well. And then we'll do serological analysis to look further at epitope mapping, repertoire analysis of the memory B cells, and on and on and on. And that's the group in Dr. Barney Graham's lab. Uh, there's Dr. Graham, there's Tracy Ruckwort, uh, who has headed up a lot of the lab work on this, and Man Chen, who developed the neutralization assays that are used in analyzing so many of these sera, uh, and Emily Fung, a grad student who did a lot of ELISAs. And that's Barney's truck, which has the license plate vaccinator. He appreciates, he always has us pose right by the no parking sign too. <laughs> and uh, some collaborators, of course, all of the Vaccine Research Center, um, the animal group, um, the clinical group, and uh, all of NIAD, uh, as well as um, Jamen University who helped us with um, discovering some of the antibodies that allowed us to crystallize the pre-F structure in the first place, as well as Jason McClelland. Um, who was instrumental in that structural work as well. And that is the clinical trials program um, who helped me to complete the clinical trial. And of course, the most important would be the study volunteers. <coughs>